Story eleven of Wounds in the Rain War Stories by Stephen Crane. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story eleven The Second Generation Parts one through three. One Caspar Cadogan resolved to go to the tropic wars and do something. The air was blue and gold with the pomp of soldiering and in every ear rang the music of military glory. Caspar's father was a United States Senator from the great state of Skalmulligan, where the war fever ran very high. Chill is the blood of many of the sons of millionaires, but Caspar took the fever and posted to Washington. His father had never denied him anything, and this time all that Caspar wanted was a little captaincy in the army, just a simple little captaincy. The old man had been entertaining a delegation of respectable bunco-steerers from Skullmulligan, who had come to him on a matter which is none of the public's business. Bottles of whiskey and boxes of cigars were still on the table in the sumptuous private parlour. The senator had said, "'Well, gentlemen, I'll do what I can for you.' By this sentence he meant whatever he meant." Then he turned to his eager son. Well, Caspar? The youth poured out his modest desires. It was not altogether his fault. Life had taught him a generous faith in his own abilities. If anyone had told him that he was simply an ordinary damned fool, he would have opened his eyes wide at the person's lack of judgment. All his life people had admired him. The Skalmulligan war-horse looked with quick disapproval into the eyes of his son. "'Well, Caspar,' he said slowly, "'I am of the opinion that they've got all the golf experts and tennis champions and cotillion leaders and piano-tuners and billiard-markers that they really need as officers. Now, if you were a soldier—' "'I know,' said the young man with a gesture. But I'm not exactly a fool, I hope, and I think if I get a chance I can do something. I'd like to try. I would indeed." The senator lit a cigar. He assumed an attitude of ponderous reflection. Yes, but this country is full of young men who are not fools. Full of em. Caspar fidgeted in the desire to answer that while he admitted the profusion of young men who were not fools, he felt that he himself possessed interesting and peculiar qualifications which would allow him to make his mark in any field of effort which he seriously challenged. But he did not make this graceful statement, for he sometimes detected something ironic in his father's temperament. The Skalmulligan war-horse had not thought of expressing an opinion of his own ability since the year 1865, when he was young, like Caspar. "'Well, well,' said the senator finally, "'I'll see about it, I'll see about it.' The young man was obliged to wait the end of his father's characteristic method of thought. The war-horse never gave a quick answer, and if people tried to hurry him they seemed able to arouse only a feeling of irritation against making a decision at all. His mind moved like the wind but practice had placed a Mexican bit in the mouth of his judgment. This old man of light, quick thought had taught himself to move like an ox-cart. Caspar said, Yes, sir. He withdrew to his club, where, to the affectionate inquiries of some envious friends, he replied, The old man is letting the idea soak. The mind of the war-horse was decided far sooner than Caspar expected. In Washington a large number of well-bred, handsome young men were receiving appointments as lieutenants, as captains, and occasionally as majors. They were a strong, healthy, clean-eyed, educated collection. They were a prime lot. A German field-marshal would have beamed with joy, if he could have had them, to send to school. Anywhere in the world they would have made a grand show as material, but intrinsically they were not lieutenants, captains, and majors. They were fine men, though manhood is only an essential part of a lieutenant, a captain, or a major. But at any rate this arrangement had all the logic of going to sea in a bathing machine. 
The senator found himself reasoning that Caspar was as good as any of them, and better than many. Presently he was bleating here and there that his boy should have a chance. "'The boy's all right, I tell you, Henry. He's wild to go, and I don't see why they shouldn't give him a show. He's got plenty of nerve, and he's keen as a whiplash. I'm going to get him an appointment, and if you can do anything to help it along, I wish you would.' Then he betook himself to the White House and the War Department, and made a stir. People think that administrations are always slavishly, abominably anxious to please the machine. They are not. They wish the machine sunk in red fire, for by the power of ten thousand past words, looks, gestures, writings, the machine comes along and takes the administration by the nose and twists it and the administration dare not even yell. The huge force which carries an election to success looks reproachfully at the administration and says, Give me a bun. That is a very small thing with which to reward a colossus. The Skalmulligan war-horse got his bun and took it to his hotel, where Caspar was moodily reading war rumors. Well, my boy, here you are. Caspar was a captain and commissary on the staff of Brigadier General Riley, commander of the 2nd Brigade of the 1st Division of the 30th Army Corps. "'I had to work for it,' said the senator grimly. "'They talked to me as if they thought you were some sort of empty-headed idiot. None of them seemed to know you personally. They just sort of took it for granted. Finally I got pretty hot in the collar.' He paused a moment, his heavy, grooved face set hard, his blue eyes shone. He clapped a hand down upon the handle of his chair. "'Casper, I've got you into this thing, and I believe you'll do all right, and I'm not saying this because I distrust either your sense or your grit. But I want you to understand you've got to make a go of it. I'm not going to talk any twaddle about your country and your country's flag. You understand all about that. But now you're a soldier, and there'll be this to do, and that to do, and fighting to do, and you've got to do every damned one of them, right up to the handle. I don't know how much of a shindy this thing is going to be, but any shindy is enough to show how much there is in a man. You've got your appointment, and that's all I can do for you. But I'll thrash you with my own hands if, when the army gets back, the other fellows say my son is nothing but a good-looking dude. He ceased, breathing heavily. Caspar looked bravely and frankly at his father, and answered in a voice which was not very tremulous, I'll do my best. This is my chance. I'll do my best with it. The senator had a marvelous ability of transition from one manner to another. Suddenly he seemed very kind. Well, that's all right, then. I guess you'll get along all right with Riley. I know him well, and he'll see you through. I helped him along once. And now about this commissary business. As I understand it, a commissary is a sort of caterer in a big way. That is, he looks out for a good many more things than a caterer has to bother his head about. Riley's brigade has probably from two to three thousand men in it and in regard to certain things you've got to look out for every man of em every day. I know perfectly well you couldn't successfully run a boarding-house in Ocean Grove. How are you going to manage for all these soldiers, eh? Thought about it? No, said Caspar, injured. I didn't want to be a commissary. I wanted to be a captain in the line. They wouldn't hear of it. They said you would have to take a staff appointment where people could look after you. "'Well, let them look after me,' cried Caspar resentfully. "'But when there's any fighting to be done, I guess I won't necessarily be the last man.' "'That's it,' responded the senator. "'That's the spirit.' They both thought that the problem of war would eliminate to an equation of actual battle. Ultimately, Caspar departed into the south to an encampment in salty grass under pine trees. Here lay an army corps, twenty thousand strong. Caspar passed into the dusty sunshine of it, and for many weeks he was lost to view. 2. 
"'Of course I don't know a blamed thing about it,' said Caspar frankly, and modestly to a circle of his fellow staff officers. He was referring to the duties of his office. Their faces became expressionless. They looked at him with eyes in which he could fathom nothing. After a pause, one politely said, uh, "'Don't you?' It was the inevitable two words of convention. "'Why,' cried Caspar, "'I didn't know what a commissary officer was until I was one. My old governor told me. He'd looked it up in a book somewhere, I suppose, but I didn't know.' Uh, "'Didn't you?' The young man's face glowed with sudden humor. Do you know, the word was intimately associated in my mind with camels. Funny, eh? I think it came from reading that rhyme of Kipling's about the commissariat camel. Did it? Yes. Funny, isn't it? Camels. The brigade was ultimately landed at Saboni as part of an army to attack Santiago. The scene at the landing sometimes resembled the inspiriting daily drama at the approach to the Brooklyn Bridge. There was a great bustle, during which the wise man kept his property gripped in his hands, lest it might march off into the wilderness in the pocket of one of the striding regiments. Truthfully, Caspar should have had frantic occupation, but men saw him wandering bootlessly here and there, crying, "'Has any one seen my saddle-bags? Why, if I lose them, I'm ruined. I've got everything packed away in them, everything.' They looked at him gloomily and without attention. "'No,' they said. It was to intimate that they would not give a rip if he had lost his nose, his teeth, and his self-respect." Riley's brigade collected itself from the boats and went off, each regiment's soul burning with anger because some other regiment was in advance of it. Moving along through the scrub and under the palms, men talked mostly of things that did not pertain to the business in hand. General Riley finally planted his headquarters in some tall grass under a mango tree. "'Where's Cadogan?' he said suddenly, as he took off his hat and smoothed the wet gray hair from his brow. Nobody knew. Well, I saw him looking for his saddlebags down at the landing, said an officer dubiously. Oh, bother him, said the general contemptuously. Let him stay there. Three venerable regimental commanders came, saluted stiffly, and sat in the grass. There was a pow-wow, during which Riley explained much that the division commander had told him. The venerable colonels nodded. They understood. Everything was smooth and clear to their minds, but still the colonel of the 44th Regular Infantry murmured about the commissariat. His men, and then he launched forth in a sentiment concerning the privations of his men, in which you were confronted with his feeling that his men— his men were the only creatures of importance in the universe, which feeling was entirely correct for him. Riley grunted. He did what most commanders did. He set the competent line to doing the work of the incompetent part of the staff. In time, Caspar came trudging along the road, merrily swinging his saddlebags. "'Well, General,' he cried as he saluted, "'I found them. "'Did you?' said Riley. Later an officer rushed to him tragically. General, Cadogan is off there in the bushes eating potted ham and crackers all by himself. The officer was sent back into the bushes for Caspar, and the general sent Caspar with an order. Then Riley and the three venerable colonels, grinning, partook of potted ham and crackers. Tasha right, said Riley, with his mouth full. Dorsey, see if he's got something else. "'Mush be selfish, young pig,' said one of the colonels, with his mouth full. "'Who's he, General?' "'Son, Senator Cadogan, a friend mine, dash him.' Caspar wrote a letter. "'Dear father, I am sitting under a tree using the flattest part of my canteen for a desk. Even as I write, the division ahead of us is moving forward, and we don't know what moment the storm of battle may break out.' I don't know what the plans are. General Riley knows, but he is so good as to give me very little of his confidence. 
In fact, I might be part of a forlorn hope, from all to the contrary I've heard from him. I understood you to say in Washington that you, at one time, had been of some service to him, but if that is true, I can assure you he has completely forgotten it. At times his manner to me is little short of being offensive, but of course I understand that it is only the way of a crusty old soldier who has been made boorish and bearish by a long life among the Indians. I dare say I shall manage it all right without a row. When you hear that we have captured Santiago, please send me by first steamer a box of provisions and clothing, particularly sardines, pickles, and lightweight underwear. The other men on the staff are nice, quiet chaps, but they seem a bit crude. There has been no fighting yet, save the skirmish by Young's brigade. Riley was furious because we couldn't get in it. I met General Peel yesterday. He was very nice. He said he knew you well when he was in Congress. Young Jack May is on Peel's staff. I knew him well in college. We spent an hour talking over old times. Give my love to all at home. The march was leisurely. Riley and his staff strolled out to the head of the long, sinuous column and entered the sultry gloom of the forest. Some less fortunate regiments had to wait among the trees at the side of the trail, and as Riley's brigade passed them, officer called to officer, classmate to classmate, and in these greetings rang a note of everything from West Point to Alaska. They were going into an action in which they, the officers, would lose over a hundred in killed and wounded, officers alone, and these greetings, in which many nicknames occurred, were in many cases farewells, such as one pictures being given with ostentation, solemnity, fervor. There goes Gory Widgeon. Hello, Gory, where are you starting for? Hey, Gory! Caspar communed with himself, and decided that he was not frightened. He was eager and alert. He thought that now his obligation to his country or himself was to be faced, and he was mad to prove to old Riley and the others that after all he was a very capable soldier. 3. Old Riley was stumping along the line of his brigade and mumbling like a man with a mouthful of grass. The fire from the enemy's position was incredible in its swift fury, and Riley's brigade was getting its share of a very bad ordeal. The old man's face was of the color of a tomato, and in his rage he mouthed and sputtered strangely. As he pranced along his thin line, scornfully erect, voices arose from the grass beseeching him to take care of himself. At his heels scrambled a bugler with pallid skin and clenched teeth, a chalky, trembling youth who kept his eye on old Riley's back and followed it. The old gentleman was quite mad. Apparently he thought the whole thing a dreadful mess, but now that his brigade was irrevocably in it, he was full-tilting, here and everywhere, to establish some irreproachable, immaculate kind of behavior on the part of every man Jack in his brigade. The intentions of the three venerable colonels were the same. They stood behind their lines, quiet, stern, courteous old fellows, admonishing their regiments to be very pretty in the face of such a hail of magazine-rifle and machine-gun fire as has never in this world been confronted save by beardless savages when the white man has found occasion to take his burden to some new place. And the regiments were pretty. The men lay on their little stomachs and got peppered according to the law and said nothing, as the good blood pumped out into the grass, and even if a solitary rookie tried to get a decent reason to move to some haven of rational men, the cold voice of an officer made him look criminal with a shame that was a credit to his regimental education. Behind Riley's command was a bullet-torn jungle through which it could not move as a brigade. Ahead of it were Spanish trenches on hills. Riley considered that he was in a fix, no doubt, but he said this only to himself. 
Suddenly he saw on the right a little point of blue-shirted men already halfway up the hill. It was some pathetic fragment of the 6th United States Infantry. Chagrined, shocked, horrified, Riley bellowed to his bugler, and the chalk-faced youth unlocked his teeth and sounded the charge by rushes. The men formed hastily and grimly and rushed. Apparently there awaited them only the fate of respectable soldiers. But they went, because of the opinion of others, perhaps. They went, because no loud-mouthed lot of jailbirds such as the 27th Infantry could do anything that they could not do better. They went, because Riley ordered it. They went, because they went. And yet not a man of them to this day has made a public speech explaining precisely how he did the whole thing, and detailing with what initiative and ability he comprehended and defeated a situation which he did not comprehend at all. Riley never saw the top of the hill. He was heroically striving to keep up with his men, when a bullet ripped quietly through his left lung, and he fell back into the arms of the bugler, who received him as he would have received a Christmas present. The three venerable colonels inherited the brigade in swift succession. The senior commanded for about fifty seconds, at the end of which he was mortally shot. Before they could get the news to the next in rank, he too was shot. The junior colonel ultimately arrived with a lean and puffing little brigade at the top of the hill. The men lay down and fired volleys at whatever was practicable. In and out of the ditch-like trenches lay the Spanish dead, lemon-faced corpses dressed in shabby blue and white ticking. Some were huddled down comfortably like sleeping children. One had died in the attitude of a man flung back in a dentist's chair. One sat in the trench with his chin sunk despondently to his breast. Few preserved a record of the agitation of battle. With the greater number it was as if death had touched them so gently, so lightly, that they had not known of it. Death had come to them rather in the form of an opiate than of a bloody blow. But the arrived men in the blue shirts had no thought of the sallow corpses. They were eagerly exchanging a hail of shots with the Spanish second line, whose ash-colored entrenchments barred the way to a city white amid trees. In the pauses the men talked. "'We done the best. Old E Company got there. Why, one time the hull of B Company was behind us.' "'Jones, he was the first man up. I saw him.' "'Which Jones?' "'Did you see old Two Bars running like a land crab? Made good time, too. He hit only in the high places. He's all right.' "'The lieutenant's all right, too. He was a good ten yards ahead of the best of us. I hated him at the post.' but for this here active service there's none of em can touch him. This is mighty different from being at the post. Well, we'd done it, and it wasn't because I thought it could be done. When we started, I says to myself, well, here goes a lot of damned fools. Tain't over yet. Oh, they'll never get us back from here. If they start to chase us back from here, we'll pile em up so high the last ones can't climb over. We've come this far, and we'll stay here. I ain't done pantin'. Anything is better than packin' through that jungle and gettin' blistered from front, rear, and both flanks. I'd rather tackle another hill than go trailin' in them woods, so thick you can't tell whether you are one man or a division of cavalry. Where's that young kitchen soldier, Cadigan, or whatever his name is? Ain't seen him today. Well, I seen him. He was right in with it. He got shot, too, about halfway up the hill, in the leg. I seen it. He's all right. Don't worry about him. He's all right. I seen him, too. He'd done his stunt. As soon as I can get this piece of barbed wire entanglement out of me throat, I'll give him a cheer. He ain't shot at all, because there it stands there. See him? Rearward, the grassy slope was populous, with little groups of men searching for the wounded. Riley's brigade began to dig with its bayonets and shovel with its meat-ration cans. End of section 18